So I grew up in an incredibly beautiful place called La Jolla, California. And growing up in La Jolla ain't bad, let me tell you. I used to hang out on the beach all day long. I used to ride my bike with my friends everywhere around town. And we didn't have cell phones then, so our parents had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> it was awesome. But one day when I was 14 years old, I decided to go off on my own and ride around the campus of the University of California, San Diego, which was just a few blocks away from my house. And the great thing about UCSD and probably every university back then was nobody locked their doors. You could just walk into buildings and check stuff out. And I decided to take advantage of that one day. And I walked into this building, which was really cool looking. Uh, and I was going down this hall and there was a door open halfway down the hall. And I looked in and I saw this gentleman at a desk holding a human brain in his hands. This gentleman turns out to be Robert Livingston, uh, who was one of the foremost neuroscientists at the time. Um, and I was just staring at this brain. I was transfixed. And he looked at me finally, realizing I was there, and said, would you like to see this? Would you like to come in and look at this? And I kept thinking, you know, my mom always said, don't take candy from strangers. <laughs> but she never said anything about brains. <laughs> So I walked in and I got this incredible tour of the human brain. And from that moment on, I decided neuroscience was really cool. And in fact, I got to work in his lab after school and got to do science fair projects, which eventually took me to a career in neuroscience. It started by going here in Portland, Oregon at Reed College, uh, and then on to get a PhD at OHSU. Now, what's remarkable was that entire time, something I learned about science and scientists was that scientists are really well-liked and well-respected people. At least they were then. And science was thought of by everybody I talked to as an answer for most of the problems that we face on our planet. I went off to Karlsruhe, Germany for my postdoctoral research uh, section, kind of like a, a little like an apprenticeship, if you will. And in Karlsruhe, what was remarkable was I was told that if you tell the utilities people that you are Herr Dr. Sherman, not just Herr Dr., but Herr Dr. Sherman, and not just Herr Sherman, they're going to hook up your utilities faster because scientists are respected people and they think it's important that your phone lines work. Kind of cool. So this was this impression that I've always had that scientists and science was something that was really respected. And something changed when I came back to the United States. I came to work at the University of Cincinnati in, in for several years and as an assistant professor. And during those years in that lab, I realized that people were really becoming very skeptical about science. All sorts of things were coming up saying, maybe scientists aren't such the, the best people. Why? What was happening? And I thought, this is crazy. But then, if you think about it, this has been happening for a very, very long time. We have this image of scientists and science that you know, has changed not so much if you think about it. If you go back to the earliest science, we have this idea that the Earth revolves around the sun because of the work of one particular scientist. And that scientist was the gentleman here on the left, Galileo, looking on with a very skeptical looking member of the Catholic Church. Now, Galileo did some amazing things. He came up with the first ideas for how to do science, what we call the scientific method. He also came up with mathematics to describe data and in a quantifiable way, which was really revolutionary. And using these techniques, he did all sorts of great things. He discovered properties of motion, properties of materials, and he did some amazing things with astronomy, including showing, using data, that Copernicus was right, that in fact the Earth does revolve around the sun, not the other way around. And for this discovery, he was labeled a heretic and imprisoned. And as a result of that, we had this version of the universe for quite some time. Now, this is not unique to astronomy. Um, if we go forward just a few hundred years, uh, we find that Darwin faced some similar uh, opposition to his data. Darwin used amazing techniques to come up with his treaties on the origin of species to suggest the idea that natural selection leads to this evolutionary process. He used a lot of data tremendous amounts of studies, observational studies, to come up with this theory. Um, and yet, even at the time of Darwin, but just a few years afterwards, in 1925, for example, in this country, Tennessee outlawed the teaching altogether of evolution. 
And when that law was challenged by a teacher, it led to a trial, the famous Scopes trial, or the monkey trial, people called it, in which not only was the teacher, Scopes, put on trial, but the whole theory of evolution was put on trial. And unfortunately, it lost. Now, that has led to what we have today. That was the beginnings of an anti-science movement, if you will, an anti-rational thinking movement, if you will. Uh, call it what you will, creationism or intelligent design. But the basis of these ideas is simply that it's too complicated, therefore it can't be explained by science. It's not just evolution, though. For some reason, which is unbelievable to me, in the 21st century, there are people who believe the Earth is flat. What's more, there are people who fail to accept the possibility even, despite tremendous amounts of data from very well-respected scientists, and lots of them, I should add, that our, wor our world is actually warming. Not only is our world, world warming, but the effects of that seem to be linked to changes in carbon dioxide generated by mankind. And this trend is continuing, and we continue to argue about it as the world continues to heat up. Now, that has been denied on so many levels, and what's interesting is the groups that deny it come up with names for themselves like this one, the Friends of Science. But we know that these are not friends of real science. Instead, they're friends of science that is trying to be defending something else. The other that remarkable thing is in this day and age, despite having a history in humanity where millions of people died from flu epidemics, for example, that vaccines are somehow evil. This was actually nothing new. The anti-vaccine movement actually was very strong in the 1800s, possibly for very good reasons. There were very bad vaccines back then, but things have changed. Vaccines have proven themselves time and again to save millions of lives every, t every time something hits our population. And yet, people have been in the wings just almost like they're waiting to attack this idea that vaccines are, are still good today because one single study comes out from a gentleman named Wakefield claiming that there is a link between vaccination and autism. And yet it's been proven time and again that there was a lot of corruption involved in this study. The study was false. It's actually been retracted. Um, and yet we still have people who are denying vaccinations are a good idea. So there are many reasons why people attack science. Money is one of them. If there's a financial interest that is being challenged because some scientific evidence says that, for example, a company's processes are polluting or damaging to the environment, they're going to really try to protect that money. Uh, and this happens time and time again. Religion is also, unfortunately, a, a driving force between a lot of science denial, as we saw in the case of Galileo and in the case of Darwin. But it's still true today. If your dogma and your beliefs are being challenged by a scientific study, it's understandable that you're going to react negatively to it. And of course, politicians take advantage of both of these things. But in addition, people take advantage of the fact that there's an emotional response to some of these studies. In the case of the Wakefield paper on autism, people want to know why their children are coming down with autism. And if there's a cause out there, they're going to react at a very emotional level. So the tactics that these groups are using to sort of amplify these ideas include manipulating public messaging, like calling yourself a friend of science, like the organization name, and, and denying all the climate data. Uh, but also taking any state statement made in some paper and either blowing it out of proportion one way or the other to sort of meet the needs of the people and their messaging. Economic manipulation is also a clear tactic, withholding funds uh, or making it very difficult to get s certain types of funds or selectively funding the studies that are in agreement with what your corporation or your group uh, wants to hear. Delay is also another tactic, for, for example, causing uh, some sort of litigation that will prevent uh, some study from going forward, demanding every piece of little data at each step of the process. Harassment is also something that we see happening quite a bit in science. People are harassed for the work they do, uh, and it causes, again, delays in, in their ability to do their work. And then finally, so-called so hidden identities, masquerading as grassroots organizations, for example, when in fact you're being funded by another interest. So the consequences are interesting. This is a map, and I, there's consequences for every field of science. That's where we're seeing this happening. And I, and I think most of us are familiar with the potential consequences of climate change. But here's a map from 2008 of outbreaks of various diseases, like whooping cough, measles, and mumps, for example. And you can see the distribution. There's, there were outbreaks, for sure, in 2008. But then the anti-vaxxer movement really got it started. And in 2017, this is what the map looks like. 
We've had increases in diseases that we haven't seen in years popping up all over the place. And these diseases are not just mild cases of outbreaks of colds. These are diseases that kill people. And so we may actually, in fact, continue, if we don't continue to pre prevent this type of thing from happening, have another pandemic. What can we do? Well, I think we all have our own ideas about how to change people's ideas about science. Um, I have taken a personal approach, and I would like to challenge everybody here to do this. If you're a scientist, or even if you're not a scientist, but you believe that science has value, the first thing is to dedicate yourself to challenging people to accept that science is a rational thing to, to accept. Not all science is correct. Science is a process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. We come up with theories based on hypotheses, but theories are pretty solid ideas once we get to them. Once you get to that point, use that dedication to educate people around you in your communities uh, and educate people to understand what science is really all about. And then communicate. Communicate that science in a way that's clear and concise and something that people can really follow. I've done something that I've been having a lot of fun with in this regard, with regards to the education arm. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been running a science fair workshop and a science fair for fifth graders. And these kids come up with the most amazing ideas, but in the process of doing these projects, they're challenged to come up with something novel and something that they have a passion for, that they're really interested in. Um, and they learn what science is like. They learn that experiments go wrong. They also learn that how to interpret data properly. They also know that sometimes two averages compared to each other may not be meaningful unless you do something else to analyze those data. And we hear about this all the time. It's great seeing them challenge this data. The other thing that's remarkable and fun for me is talking about my science to the general public. Now, unfortunately, I have a, a profession which is just laden with lingo. Uh, there are words that I don't even know how to pronounce. Um, this is one of our, our papers from several years ago. And the, the title, as you can see, is Hyaluronin Accumulates in Demyelinated Lesions and Inhibits Oligodendrocyte Progenitor uh, Maturation. And most of you are probably thinking, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and why should I care? Well, if I want to talk to people who are not in my own field, I need to come up with a different language. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. Not all of us, I probably won't understand your lingo from your field either. A better title might be a sugar molecule that builds up following brain injury, and it prevents cells from repairing the damage. And in fact, this is work that we're using now to try to find a way to get the brain to repair itself in people with multiple sclerosis. So, we need to learn how to talk about our science as scientists to people. And as some science communicators and educators and community members, we need to be able to learn about those science findings and communicate them clearly. Finally, I love talking about science. Um, and I love to get people excited about science. And my approach has been to take things that I'm really interested in and kind of let people know there's science in just about everything. My favorite thing to do is I play the piano and I get to talk about music and the brain and I make people sing, which is awesome. And when I get to talk about all these things in the brain and the music and put it all together, people think, oh, neuroscience is pretty cool. I also talk about love in the brain, especially around Valentine's Day, it's a lot of fun. So these kinds of activities, maybe they're not for everybody, but this communication, education, and dedication, when you put these three things together, I think we have a chance of bringing rationality back to the way we talk about the world where there's respect that we need from scientists and for science. And the next time some kid walks into a lab and sees a brain, they'll be inspired and have a world where the science that they're going to do is going to be appreciated. Thank you so much.